Few histories have been rewritten so completely and so soon as the history of the Reagan administration. From innumerable outlets of the anointed, the media, academia, and the lecture platform poured the new revised history of the Reagan administration that its reduction in tax rates in the early 1980s, tax cuts for the rich being the popular phrase, had brought on record federal deficits. Yet this revisionist history of the 1980s is easily refuted with widely available official statistics on the federal government's tax receipts, spending, and deficits during the eight years of the Reagan administration. The year before Ronald Reagan became president, the federal government took in $517 billion in tax revenues, which was the all-time high up to that point. The record of tax revenues and expenditures during the Reagan years, from 1981 through 1988, is as follows. 1981, $599 billion in receipts, $678 billion in outlays, a $79 billion deficit. 1982, $618 billion in receipts, $746 billion in outlays, a $128 billion deficit. 1983, $601 billion in receipts, $808 billion in outlays, a $208 billion deficit. 1984, $666 billion in receipts, $851 billion in outlays, a $185 billion deficit. 1985, $734 billion in receipts, $946 billion in outlays, a $212 billion deficit. 1986, $769 billion in receipts, $990 billion in outlays, a $212 billion deficit. 1987, $854 billion in receipts, $1,004 billion in outlays, a $149 billion deficit. 1988, $909 billion in receipts, $1,064 billion in outlays, a $155 billion deficit. Contrary to the notion that deficits have resulted from reduced tax receipts by the federal government, those receipts in fact reached new record highs during the Reagan administration. Every year of that administration saw the federal government collect more money than in any year of any previous administration in history. By the last year of the Reagan administration in 1988, the federal government collected over $391 billion more than during any year of the Carter administration. In percentage terms, the government took in 76% more that year than it had ever collected in any year of any other administration. The idea that tax cuts, for the rich or otherwise, were responsible for the deficit flies in the face of these easily obtainable statistics. Spending increases simply outstripped the rising volume of tax receipts, even though hundreds of billions of dollars more were pouring into Washington than ever before. But of course, there is no amount of money that cannot be overspent. The very idea of tax cuts reflects verbal ambiguities of the sort so often exploited by the verbally adept among the anointed. Except for one year, tax receipts never fell during the two Reagan administrations, and even that one year, tax receipts were higher than they had ever been in any previous administration. It was tax rates that were cut. As for the rich, even if we accept the popular definition of them as people currently above some given income level, those in the top income brackets paid larger sums of money after the Reagan tax rate cuts than before. They even paid a higher percentage of all the taxes paid in the country, according to a report of the House Ways and Means Committee controlled by Democrats. What bothered the liberals was that the rich paid a smaller percentage of their rising incomes than before. But whatever the metaphysics of fairness, revisionist history can be checked against hard data, and it fails that test. Corresponding to the notion that tax cuts for the rich caused the rising national debt has been the notion that cutbacks in spending on social programs were responsible for much social pathology, including the growth of homelessness. However, as liberal scholar Christopher Jenks has pointed out, actual federal spending on housing increased throughout the years of the Reagan administration. What declined were appropriations, the legal authorization of future spending. In other words, hypothetical money declined, but hard cash increased. Since it is hard cash that pays for housing, homelessness has its roots in other factors besides government spending on housing. While there were some social programs that were actually cut during the Reagan administration, most cutbacks in social programs were reductions in projected levels of future spending, 
That is, if Program X were spending $100 million a year before the Reagan administration took office and was seeking to expand to $150 million a year, an actual expansion to $135 million would be called a cutback in spending of $15 million, even though the program received $35 million more than it had ever received before. This is Washington newspeak, rather than anything that most people would regard as a cutback anywhere else. For many of the anointed, it was never sufficient to declare the Reagan administration's economic, social, or foreign policies mistaken, malign, or even dangerous. It was necessary to ridicule them as the products of a consummately stupid president, an amiable dunce, as Democratic elder statesman Clark Clifford called him. This denigration of Ronald Reagan began even before he became president, and was in fact one of the reasons why his chances of becoming even the Republican nominee, much less president, were considered nil. As Washington Post editorial board member Meg Greenfield recalled the mood she saw among Washington insiders in 1980, it was the wisdom of the other contenders and of most Republican Party leaders, too, not to mention of practically everyone in Democratic politics, that Reagan was too old, too extreme, too marginal, and not nearly smart enough to win the nomination. The Democrats, in fact, when they weren't chortling about him, were fervently hoping he would be the nominee. When he carried the convention in Detroit, people I knew in the Carter White House were ecstatic. This assessment of Reagan remained even after he defeated President Carter in a landslide in the 1980 elections. This view of him remained unchanged as he got major legislation, the Reagan Revolution, through Congress over the opposition of those who disdained him, despite the fact that the Republicans were never a majority in both houses of Congress during the first Reagan administration and were not a majority in either house during the second. In a 1987 essay full of condescending references to Ronnie, Gore Vidal used as the crowning example of President Reagan's being out of touch with reality the following quotation from the president. I believe that communism is another sad, bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages even now are being written. The later sudden collapse of communism in the Soviet bloc was foreseen by very few of the anointed who ridiculed Reagan. The point here is not to reassess the Reagan administration, a task that can be left to future historians, but to examine the role of evidence for the anointed. Here, as elsewhere, the criteria they used were not pragmatic criteria of success, whether at the polls, in Washington politics, or on the international stage. The overriding criterion was consonance with the vision of the anointed, and Ronald Reagan had to fail that test, because no president in half a century was so completely out of step with that vision. The choices facing the anointed were abandonment of a cherished vision or depicting Ronald Reagan as a bumbling idiot, even if that meant treating concrete evidence as irrelevant.